Hi there, and welcome to the podcast, Life as a, a show intently focused on exploring and unearthing the details, of professions, and the people behind them. I'm your host, Christopher Schoenwald. For many wine lovers, the dream is often to retire in some exotic locale and fulfill the fantasy of producing their own vintage. The idyllic appeal of it all is rather intoxicating. However, for most, that dream is just that, a romantic notion. Well, our guest today managed to veer off the path of make-believe and make it a reality for herself. Elka Parsons is the owner of Elk Wines, a family-owned and operated winemaking operation in the Barossa Valley, Australia. Her mission involves perfecting each vintage in order to create exceptional wine that stands up to the best in the market and are accessible to all wine lovers. Every elk wine is handpicked from a single vineyard representing only the best from the Barossa and Eden Valley regions of Australia. Varietal regionality sits at the core of elk wine's boutique brand. Elk Wine uses natural, vegan-friendly techniques to produce outstanding quality wine, which embodies the spirit of the Barossa Valley. Now, after many years in the airline industry, in spite of her love of travel and adventure, she had the sense that something was missing, and it only took a gentle nudge and a fortuitous win at the track to literally turn her passion for wine into fruition. After that weekend at the races in Melbourne, with a small win in hand, Elka returned to the Barossa with Lady Luck on her side. She sourced the most spectacular Riesling fruit, and through skill and determination, created their flagship, Elk Wines Eden Valley Riesling. And thus, Elk Wines was born. Now, recognizing that providing something unique in a highly competitive industry requires ongoing learning and exploration, Elka combines her love of travel and learning by continuing to explore vineyards across the world and studying viticulture and enology at the University of Adelaide. With all of that in mind, Elka, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, really excited to have you on today. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah. great to see you. Yeah, I'm also inspired to see that, that uh, glass of wine in hand, too. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> nice, good for you. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to jump right into our first segment here. Now. Um, and it's something called Coloring Wikipedia. And as my listeners know, basically what this is, is we're, I read off a definition of your profession. And one, I think this is helpful, you know, brings everyone up to speed and puts us all on the same page. But then also too, I think it's a nice jumping off point because it allows us to explore kind of the hidden intricacies, things that aren't necessarily in the definition, but you know, to be true with what you do. Does that sound good? Sounds good. Go for it. All right. Well, here we go. This is a winemaker from Wikipedia. A winemaker or vinner is a person engaged in winemaking. Duties include cooperating with viticulturists, monitoring the maturity of grapes to ensure their quality and to, tr- and sorry, and to determine the correct time for harvest, crushing and pressing grapes, monitoring the settling of juice and the fermentation of grape material, filtering the wine to remove remaining solids, testing the quality of wine by tasting. That one sounds the best to me. Placing filtered wine in casks or tanks for storage and maturation, preparing plans for bottling wine once it has matured, and making sure that quality is maintained when the wine is bottled. Um, Today, these duties require an increasing amount of scientific knowledge since laboratory tests are gradually supplementing or replacing traditional methods. Winemakers can also be referred to as enologists as they study enology, the science of wine. All right, there we go. A very thorough definition. It was, wasn't it? Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Did it miss anything though? I mean, I don't think so. And as you said, the tasting bit is the most important part, both (laughs) in the vineyard and in the winery itself. So, yes. Nice, excellent. Are are there anything? I'd be curious, like, are there any elements within that definition that are of critical importance to say your business that you really place a, a you know a higher degree of importance on than so you some yeah, of the I, others yeah sure for me definitely it's the vineyard um it all starts in the vineyard for me i'm a very small batch producer so um finding that vineyard that works um because it's only you know one to two ton each time so mm. um making sure 
the time of the pick is right as well. Um, that's crucial for me. And because I am so small, I don't have the massive logistics that other big commercial wineries do. They have to wait till they have space in the winery to pick, whereas I'm very lucky. I just call on my family and friends when I'm happy where the fruit's at and then we go and pick it ourselves. Um, so it makes it a fun day and um, we usually have a lovely barbie after with plenty of wine and beer flowing, so it's good fun. Oh, it does. Yeah. It's kind of fitting that vibe or that, uh, that notion of that idyllic sort of like picture, at least in my mind right now, the way you've just described it. Um, I, I'd be curious as well. I mean, what would a typical day entail for you I mean, or the closest thing to a typical day, perhaps? Well, as you know, I am a flight attendant part-time as well. So I have a day job and then um, obviously Elk Wines is my passion project. So um, a typical day for me is I have a five-year-old. So waking up with him, jumping into my bed, um, probably around just before seven and then getting him ready for school. He's just started school uh, last week. So that was very exciting in reception. So a new mm. step for me, which will give me more time to go and um, pursue elk wines and free up my time as well which is great get him off to school and then usually I either jump around send um, pop some wine to local restaurateurs or uh, bottle shops um, I do that on the way back and forth to school drop-offs get on the phone I do a lot of my calls in the car so get on the phone and ring around places that I don't have my wine at yet um, and yeah then it's off to I've, if it's a work day with Qantas, I'm off to Adelaide. I live about an hour's drive from the airport. So off to Adelaide for a quick, you know, Perth return or Melbourne return or three legs like I did yesterday um, and then back. And um, I'm very lucky. I have a very supportive mum and dad. Uh, my parents also live in Greenock in the Barossa. And if I'm not there to pick Jacks up or drop him at school, they are luckily dad's retired. So I have that um oh, support around me as well so yeah it's busy um and I am on holidays at the moment but when uni kicks back off um that will start in the first week of March and that's one day a week for me I'm just ticking along with that uh, I only do one to two subjects a semester four years in and um I'm halfway through so I'm just oh, keep nice. keep on keeping on yeah. It'll be a, it's yeah, a slow run, but I'll, I'll get there. And I, I learn something new every year and there's always something new going on. So it's nice to be at Adelaide Uni at Wait, where they have um, a very uh, progressive research area over there and lots of research going on all the time and you can learn more current cutting edge things. Um, I didn't have to do the degree, but I think, thought you know you can learn off other people during vintages and learn from other winemakers and that's great that's where we all learn but it's nice to get new fresh ideas and my own ideas as well and that's what drew me to go back to study and actually do the science behind it as well as do the you know the practical side of it which I'm doing Mm, mm, that's really, really quite interesting. I mean, it sounds as though you are quite busy you know, between the personal side, the family side, and then also trying to you know, get something like this off the ground. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, winemaking as a whole, as you just mentioned, I mean, the science behind it, that, that is something that probably a lot of people might often overlook, you know, mm. overlook that nature of it. And yeah, mm. to, to, to fully go into it, I, I would guess that that's an element that's critical, absolutely critical. Mm. And especially considering the day and age we're living in right now with, you know, variable climate conditions and so on and so forth, things that we'll probably discuss later on in this talk. But um, yes. yeah, no hats off to you. Um, yeah, as far as wearing a number of these different hats, you know, it sounds like, you know, the sales side, the marketing side, you know, and then also like <laughs> out in the vineyard and like looking at, uh, you know, the grapes themselves and picking and, and everything else. Um, are there particular elements of it that really, you know, draw you into it that you just, you know, almost pinch yourself that you're part of and you're really enjoying? Yeah. I, do you know what? I, I'm very lucky. Um, I was in sales prior to flying with Qantas. I was a sales exec in hotels and an event manager. And so sales has always been a part of my life as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that side doesn't faze me, which is great. But um, being out in the vineyard and walking through and, yeah, absolute pinch moments um, when you walk through a 
you know, a vineyard with a mate who's I've called on a lot of friends in the Barossa to come and help me, um, you know, while I'm learning and starting out and they've got a lot more knowledge and background than I do and so walking through and, you know, asking all these questions and getting their knowledge and just stopping and really pinching yourself and going, this is cool. Um, I had a moment this, like, last vintage last year in 21 when I was out, I did a collaboration with a friend from Qantas. Um, her and her husband own a Shiraz vineyard in Blewett Springs. Mm. And um, she said to me, Elks, I've always wanted to make wine off my own fruit. Like I just don't have the know-how or, the, you know, any idea of where to start. And I said, well, let's do it together. So um, we did it out at her block. And as I said before, we just called on all our family and friends to come out and pick a ton of fruit and we did it in small picking bins and we literally had all the kids out there and uh, they stomped on the grapes once we got them in. I made everyone distem half of it by hand, which we sat around with a cheese plate and plenty of wine and we did that, which was great. Wow. And um, you just sit around and during the, um, I have a little basket press that I use and brought that from the brasser on the back of the um, ute and was sitting there and had the tunes going because I love my music and had the tunes going and I, I did the, um, you know, you have to actually, it's like a bit of a Jenga game with a basket press um, and you have to put blocks up to push down the fruit and, right. um, yeah, you, you get in there and you push the fruit down and I just, yeah, that was a pretty cool moment when I was like, this is, this is pretty amazing that I get to do this. So, yeah. No doubt, no doubt. It does, it does sound really, you know. A bunch of pinch me moments, I suppose, in, in that line of uh, work. You know, you conversely, yeah. I'm curious as well, is there anything that has been a bit of a challenge for you in, in terms of maybe this or something that you didn't exactly expect and, you know, it's something that is a little bit tougher perhaps? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I've always said I'll walk before I run with this, you know, getting a label up and running. It's not a cheap thing to do and I'm on my own starting out. Like, you know, I'm doing this all on my own. Um, I'm a single mum, so it's, um, you know, it's not the easiest thing to do um, financially. And so I always said to myself I wouldn't make more than I could sell each year and each year I've sold everything so I was like I backed myself and went okay well it's it's working so I'll keep yeah. the first year I did a ton second year two third year three and I'll just slowly build it I'm not going to go out and do 50 ton tomorrow but I think that's mm. a good way to go and um, I, I that way I can kind of keep abreast of everything myself and do everything like the sales and the marketing and have that personal touch that when you get a lot bigger, you can't, you just yeah. can't do that. You, you'll so. have a familiarity <laughs> with all these different elements, essentially. Mm. And you'll know what's, what has worked and what, you know, maybe doesn't also at the mm. same time. So it's, yeah, it's, it sounds like you're scaling it in, in, in a way that's, you know, with sustainability in mind, you know, sustainability yeah, of the yeah. business itself. And then also your own personal and professional development along the way, it seems to be matching. Mm. So now it seems like the, uh, uh, quite the wise approach. So all right. Well, why don't we skip on over into a new segment here? I've got something called mm -hmm. a Q&A discovery. It is as it sounds. I'm just going to fire off some questions for you. And the was, this first one here kind of continues on. What we're, we're, well, sorry, what we were just chatting about. But basically, I, I'd love to know, like, what led you into this passion of winemaking? Like, how did this all begin? Well, I grew up in Eden Valley. Um, so uh, an amazing wine region for Riesling. Um, and dad had a pretty good cellar when I was young um, and you know we always sat around the table and tried a glass of wine with dinner and mum and dad would always let us try wine from a young age and you know that was good um, I never kind of went too far in my teen years with with booze which is great because I appreciate it um, mm. sitting down and enjoying a nice glass of wine and then you know, if mum and dad went away, it wasn't under lock and key. So I certainly gave it a good crack in the in the <laughs> cellar. <laughs> but, um, good on you, yeah. <laughs> from there on, um, in my 20s, I funded, I love of travel, as you said earlier. Um, that's why I started with Qantas and I funded my travel through vintages. So I did a vintage in the Barossa and then went away and travelled and then lived in Japan 
um, where I met you uh, yeah. for uh, two years, well, 18 months, I think it was in the end, um, nearly two years. And then I came home and then I did another vintage and then went over to Ireland and I lived in Galway for nearly two years. Wow. And um, then I did, I came back and I did, um, I was lucky enough to get offered a, a vintage in South Africa. So I did one in Stellenbosch as well. So wow. all up, I've done five vintages today. Um, out, that's outside of Belquines. That was in my twenties. And that's how I managed to, you know, go and enjoy a bit of the world and see the world and have a bit of fun in my twenties. So that's where it all began, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. No, that sounds quite exciting. I think it was well played on your behalf there. I think you combined a, a you know, a lot of very attractive elements and put them all together in the best possible way. No, good for you. Yeah, and I would love, I would love to continue doing overseas vintages. Like when we are able, um, you know, hopefully very soon, um, I would love to take my son and, you know, he's at the age where going, taking him for three months over to France or Spain or Italy mm. would, would not impede him at all. I think it would develop him and, you know, learning language and just having different environments. So I'm really excited to do that with him. Mm. Um, and hopefully we can do that real soon. Yeah. That sounds all too exciting. All right. Well, I have another question here for you, Alka. Um, I noticed the first thing like a visitor would, you know, catch when they go to your website, elkwines.com would be the following words here, single vineyard, handpicked, small batch. All right. So mm -hmm. could you tell me a little bit more about the significance of those words, especially maybe considering, you know, the, the context of somebody who doesn't necessarily know as much as you do about that industry, about the winemaking business? Mm. So single vineyard, first of all, um, I like the fact that, you know, some years it's not possible to get all your fruit if you're bigger from one vineyard. But for me, small batch, I can do that and I can take a ton or two ton or three ton, whatever it may be, from the one vineyard. And I know that the wine will be true to that area, to that terroir, um, to that soil, to that, you know, that place and it is that real sense of place that when you have a single vineyard you get that and I love that and I will continue I won't be from that um I think that's very special then um handpicked obviously um at the moment I can still do that we'll see when I get bigger if I can continue that because it's hard yakka um and look you know machine picking is fine and I will do that eventually it's just at the moment um, practically I can do it in that small batch and it's a great day out for family and friends and I make it a fun day and that's what we're about at the moment enjoying the company and the laughter and you know what comes with the day of picking um, and then small batch uh, at the moment obviously one to two to three tons and then you know this vintage we might get to four or five we'll see um, it'll just depend on how it looks it's looking like a a great vintage this year so we've had plenty of rain there was the hail damage um, that we had in the Barossa recently but um, you know I'm sourcing I'm very lucky I don't own vineyard as yet and I can source my fruit from wherever I choose um, and I I'm lucky enough to have some good contacts in different areas around South Australia that I can source fruit from um, obviously in McLaren Vale this year I'm going to source some Grenache from McLaren Vale a um, couple of ton and I get the ton from the Barossa just around the corner from where I live um, and then yeah take it from there so that's the small batch approach and mm. um, you can really keep a handle on things and do everything yourself uh, you know and the marketing and the sales and be the person to go up to that restaurateur and tell your story and and shake their hand and and discuss you know pricing and why they should pay it for that bottle and I think people appreciate that yeah I was about to say I mean to me the impression that I got from that is just personalized like it's just personal mm -hmm. it feels real it feels like you know the furthest thing from Anyways. something that is like you know like disconnected from a massive say winery that like you said is maybe using machinery and such well by necessity of course but of course yeah the, the way it was described on your side I mean you it has that personal element and and then the Again, I would probably help, as you said, when you're going in and you're telling your story and, and, you know, each, each element, each step in that process is personalized and there's meaning behind all of it. And uh, yeah, probably, you know, the, the marketing side of things, uh, the possibilities of spinning that in so many different ways, it would be endless. Right. But yeah. I wish I had more hours in the day because I'd be doing a lot more of that, but it's, um, you, you know, you do what you can do and 
I'm just enjoying the ride at the moment. It's pretty cool. Yeah, excellent. Well, I've got another question here for you. Um, in researching this talk, um, you know, quite frankly, I came across some words that I didn't expect to see. You know, when I was researching winemaking, um, and a couple of them, I'm just going to read them off to you right now. One was sustainability, okay, and then the other one was vegan. I'd love to hear, maybe you could speak to both in terms of how they relate to your business or, you know, I mean, how they relate to the winemaking industry or wine market as a whole right now. Yeah, sustainability, of course, at the moment, um, it's huge. You know, we're, climate change is definitely upon us and we are having, as winemakers and viticulturalists, we are having to look at other varietals that work in Australia. Um, the Riverland in particular, I was up there the other day looking at some fruit and um, we're going to have to choose varieties that work with our climate. So those real hardier Mediterranean styles, um, Spanish styles, and um, someone that's doing that really well at the moment is Ashley Ratko for Terra, um, at Ricoterra. He's doing some great varietals and really focusing on that, which is great. Um, but I think sustainability, water management and, you know, water is a huge thing in our industry and we've just got to be so careful. I'm very passionate about keeping the world, um, you know, as beautiful and as amazing as it can be for our kids. You know, we both have kids and how important it is to leave it as well as we can for them. So water management for me and sustainability is in you know, what can we do to change our mindset on what varietals we plant and, um, yeah, how just be thoughtful on the way we go mm -hmm. about things um, and my small batch approach, you know, I'm not using, <laughs> you know, megalitres of water, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. using things full amounts and doing most things myself. There's yeah. no tractors or, you know, um, big industrial machines working it's all pretty hands-on so i like i like that has sorry to interrupt but in terms of say like water water related issues um <laughs> has that been something that's been gaining traction within the industry for quite some time now or is it do you think been accelerated say within the last three to five years oh it's definitely been around for a long time people have thought about it um i think dry grown helps a lot i think the fact that vines are really pretty much weeds they grow anywhere um, they're really hardy and dry grown I believe makes the best wine and the best fruit um, so they have to struggle a little bit and um, yeah being dry grown is a good thing so irrigation of course in some areas we have to do it but um, in lucky areas like Tasmania where they have great rainfall and things like that here in Australia um, you know the dry grown approach and um, especially in the Barossa, we have to do that because you'd mm. use so much water if you didn't. Yeah. So, yeah, answering your question, um, definitely the, uh, the thought process of, of being conscious with that has been around for many years. You know, I haven't been doing this for long, so I can't, right. I can't say um, how long you'd have to talk to someone a little bit more experienced than me, but um, it's definitely at the forefront of what I do. Mm. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay. In terms of the other word, vegan, yes. that, that, that vegan. one kind of blindsided me to, more so than the other, but uh, yeah. 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 I'd love to vegan hear what you got. Yeah. So I do pop that on the back of my brand. I am vegan friendly. Um, obviously there are a lot more people around the world who are uh, conscious and are vegan and, you know, I'm not, um, I grew up on a farm. I'm very happy to eat meat and eggs and cheese and whatever that the, you know, producers I grew up in a farm where we, you know, we ate the meat that came from our farm and um, the butcher came to our farm and we did it all there and, and we knew what we were eating. So um, mm. it was a pretty cool way to grow up. But mm. um, being vegan is very important to a lot of people and all that means in the winemaking process is that you don't add, um, there's a finding agent, um, called casein which is a milk product and so I simply don't use that to find I haven't had to find any of my wines yet um, so I've been very lucky because I've been very you know finding is done at the end when if you have to um, you know if you have problems if you have to clear your wine and I haven't had to do that yet so um, there are other ways you can do that so I just won't use milk products in any of my wine, wine making processes and that's how I can say I'm vegan friendly. Huh. I mean, you learn something yeah. new every day. 
I had no Ego. idea, none whatsoever. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a final process. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. Filtration is that final stage, and if you've got a bit of, you know, um, if there's been an issue or you've got some murkiness in your wine, you can use different fining agents to do that. So, and you know, milk and a few other things are just milk whites and things like that are just one way you can do that. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've got one more question in this segment, and this one's more maybe on the personal side to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. um, when I was introducing you, I was kind of noting this idyllic sort of dream and romanticism of this whole world that you're within now. But of course, at the same time, acknowledging that it is still a business. And not only that, it's a business in a highly, highly competitive industry. And you've mentioned several times, I mean, you're, you're starting out now. So like the stresses and pressures associated with any business are certainly there and they're real, of course, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I, you know, maybe you could pull back the curtain a little bit here in terms of that side of things, like the, the overall, what this business represents to you. I mean, you've I think made it clear, like there's a lot of attractive elements to it. Um, there's some challenges yeah. too, but yeah, if you could just maybe share a little bit more on that side, I think it'd be interesting for listeners to hear and myself. Yeah. Look, <laughs> yeah. It's, um, I don't think you go into this kind of thing, like having your own label to make money. It's not, you know, you're not going to get rich quick over it. That's for sure. It's not going to, um, I'm, you know, it's making a, a small tidy profit, but it's not, out of control when I'm just you know chipping away and I think um for me uh the industry at the moment obviously with um China and everything like that there's huge big big stresses placed on commercial wineries um we they no longer have that export avenue to go to China and those taxes were astronomical and you know I've not had to deal with that because I'm not at the export stage yet but um i was actually talking to a friend um it's all about your contacts along the way but um talking to a friend today over um a quick skype chat and we uh um she's in singapore and she'd like to she's got her own little wine business and she'd like to um yeah get some distribution over there for me and um it's you know with the chinese market the way it is people are having this surplus of Shiraz, especially from the Barossa, is going to be out there um, in the next few years and they're just going to have to pull back on, on quantities perhaps and uh, me specialising in, in quality, small batch, it does not affect me. But these big commercial ones, it's, it's an issue. Um, I went and had a look at some fruit in Riverland, which, you know, um, it was a bigger project and more tonnage and things like that. And I had to really think about it and think any other year, perhaps, yes. But this year with the surplus of, of Shiraz around that price point, and it's all about selling the wine at the end of the day, you can make as much as you like. You can, you know, you can get in there and make 50 tonne, 100 tonne, 10,000 tonne if you want. But if you can't sell it, then um, that's when you struggle. And it's all about that sales and I just like to get those you know channels in place first and and know that you have to walk it out the door I don't have a massive um storage shed I literally store my wine at an insulated shed at my house so that's where I store it so yeah. if I don't sell it I don't want to pay for storage so there's all those sort of things um yeah so that would be the major issues I guess at the moment is is getting rid of that um perhaps the price point of wine is a little under where I'm sitting you know the 10 15 dollar bottles of wine that go out there um mm. getting rid of that kind of wine at the moment is a bit difficult okay. mm. yeah but it's I as I said it's not it's not where I want to place myself and it's not what I'm doing but there's a lot of it out there and you know the bigger commercial wineries are are probably struggling with that as well. Yeah. Mm. I think, you know, I was struck by a, a lot of what you said there. And I think it's, I don't know, I, I, I feel as though you have this, this nice level headed approach to it all. You know, you understand where you're at within the cycle of it all, you know, where you'd potentially mm. like to go, but you're not, it, it doesn't seem at least for, for me, the way it appears, it's like you're not putting 
too much stress and pressure on yourself to get there immediately. It seems as though you're enjoying the steps along the way, the learning, the building of it, like you said, building the channels, um, establishing the relationships, so on and so forth, and just kind of taking it step by step. And for a lot of entrepreneurs, that's a challenge. That is a really incredible challenge. Like they know what they want. They want to go do it. They want to do it tomorrow. They want to have it done yesterday. You know, and like it's, things just don't work that way. But if you can find yeah. that balance of the way you're describing it and just step by step enjoying as much as possible and sharing in these moments with friends and family along the way no it's uh i, I think you're onto something there is what i'm trying to get at. don't worry i've had those moments where i want to i like you get opportunities thrown at you and i'd love to take them but you have to stop and i that's when i stop and talk to people who've been in the industry I'm, I'm surrounded by amazing friends and people who've been in it for a long time and i sit and have a wine and talk about it and yeah really think before i act and um i'd love to just go but yeah <laughs> there's yeah. something that stops it and um you know cash flow is is the thing that stops it you've got to be realistic and you've got to um make business choices that is right for your family and for me my son's only five and i really want i made a pretty early decision that i want to enjoy these young moments with him he's not he's not this age forever and um, I want to be able to volunteer at school and you know go to camps and excursions and enjoy that side of things as well so um, if I got too big too quick I wouldn't be able to do that so that's where I'm yeah good for but you I, good for you yeah. yeah yeah all right well let's go on into a new segment here Elka um, it's called a, a water cooler story it is as it sounds um, yeah I'd love to hear a story you've got but I might put you on the spot here a little bit. Um, in your bio, I was kind of reading off, you know, how you sort of started into this world. And it began with this fortuitous trip to a track in Melbourne. Um, could you continue the story for us? I, I'm dying to find out the, the background of this. Yeah, we, um, I was invited um, by a dear friend to go along to a race day at Flemington and, um, yeah, we went away for the weekend to Melbourne, um, had a great weekend, dinner with friends the night before, um, had a blast. And then um, we were lucky enough to be in one of those front corporate rooms where you get, you know, everything laid on and we did a, um, what do they call them, you know, like the Melbourne Cup day, there's a, you know, a tipping, a tipping thing where you put 20 bucks in and you pick your, your tickets and he's a very um avid he owns race horses and he's a very avid race follower um but i know nothing about horse racing really um the way i choose horses is by their name one mum always says if they're gray they're good um and i grew up going to oak bank as a kid and i would always win on the first race always um and i'd pick it because the name sounded good and look looked at the odds but that wasn't a huge thing for me so i just went by the names and picked my you know all the races went through and picked it and at the end of the day I, we were having such a great time I didn't even realize but I'd, I'd won I'd won outright the day I think wow. actually no we came I came um two people won it so we split split the winnings but still it was enough it was a tidy tidy win and it was enough to come home with a bit of cash in my hand and go okay well I can buy a ton of fruit with that let's do that and from yeah then it's the rest is history so that is fun that is real fun I like that I really day. like that story <laughs> <laughs> it was a cracking day we uh yeah let's just say there were a few sore heads the next day we went to um an izakaya restaurant I obviously um living in Japan and um, yeah. I speak Japanese. Well, I used to speak fluent, but not anymore. Um, but I just love going to Japanese restaurants. And after the big day, we went and I said, oh, dinner's on me, everyone. So we went to <laughs> Izakaya and had prawns thrown in our mouths, as you do, and had a ball. And um, I think I even got the cook in trouble because I was giving him a shot of sake <laughs> and um, sharing it with everyone. And I think I got him in a bit of trouble, actually. He left our table by the boss and didn't see him after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, seemed to, things seem to have worked out well on your side of things, uh, you, know, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, between that day, the day before, and then where we're at right now, right, with Elk Wines. Jeez, yeah, that's yeah, quite the story. I, I, yeah, really enjoyed that. Um, yeah, a bit yeah, of hard work along the way, but, you, you know, 
not 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 afraid of a bit of hard work you know, growing up no, on a, a small farm you've just got to roll up your sleeves and get in and do it that's and, right that's yeah right. have a bit of fun along the way yeah it seems like that's what you're uh, you're all about and that's what you're doing right now so kind of skipping over into our last segment here, something called a crystal ball segment. And as it implies, we're looking towards the future. And I want to lead off with this one, actually. It was something we spoke about earlier in terms of this issue of sustainability. Um, of course, you know, issues in the environment um, and sustainability are top of mind for, for a- any business um, with good reason, of course. But within your industry, uh, you know, extreme weather conditions can wreak havoc on soil, uh, fruit, so on and so forth. So in recognizing this, you know, worrying trend uh, related to sustainability and stability within, you know, the, the environment and the climate, how do you see your industry evolving? You've kind of touched upon it already in terms of like water management, but are there other areas as well that you're seeing movement? Um, as I said before, very much focused on um, varietal selection will be a big part going forward. Um, you know, big business stopping and thinking about um, where they're putting their resources and, you know, um, by you know, doing organic and biodynamic and a lot of wineries are moving that way, giving back to the earth and giving back to the soils. It's huge. Um, I love the organic biodynamic path and um if i can source my fruit from vineyards that are organic and biodynamic absolutely i'll do that 100 percent. i remember during my vintage in south africa i went out to a little vineyard in hemel and Arda, which means where heaven meets the earth it's a a beautiful place um this place just took my breath away and we went out to this little biodynamic vineyard and sat there and had a great night with the the owners of the vine, the vineyard, and um, we're sitting there chatting about biodynamics and the the moon, and you know how they when they plant and when they do things, and you know it is all that cowhide and bullshit sort of stuff. That's what it is. But people say, yeah. oh, is it just the cow? You know, the cow horns and the you know doing all that, and it is that's part of it. But there's other parts as well. You know, the moon cycles have different days and there's certain days and I'm I'm learning more about that I'm really interested in learning more and I can't wait to go to seminars on that um uh there was one in Alkina in the Bros recently and someone came out and did I didn't quite make that one but I'll certainly look into that more and and discover more about that and giving back to the soils and and the earth and making that your priority I think that's where people need to look and I think we're doing it as an industry we're already yeah. getting there and yeah it's good, good to see. within your education as well or continued education uh University of Adelaide are there mm. courses that are developed or being devoted to towards this aspect of you know managing um, there are electives yeah there are electives absolutely on sustainability and I'm not there yet you do that in your fourth year um yeah. but yeah, I'll certainly tap into some of those. There'll be a lot of different electives you can do. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure no, the reason I ask, I mean, like, I, if those things are there, certainly that would be recognition of a lot of those issues that are being faced by like a lot of people within the industry. So, yeah, I mean, in speaking with the guests on this show across so many industries, like these types of issues are popping up more and more and more, and it's hard not to to have conversations about them, which you know is a great thing. Don't get me wrong, of course, um, but it's interesting just spread at which you know it does affect so many different types of businesses and obviously with yours it's it's a clear cut you can it's really easy to see how you know these uh, environmental issues could affect you know people like yourself um, or businesses yeah. like yours so and I think you know the young ones coming through uni um, there's an amazing lecturer at my uni Beth Lovies she's amazing and she's just won an award for being an amazing amazing educator but she um she at the start of some of her classes and lectures she goes through about you know we are the young generation coming through are the ones that are going to be making these crucial hard decisions and changing things and and she just wants to um, invest all her energy in making them aware of what's so important I just love it it's um, yeah it gives me I just got goosebumps but yeah it's pretty pretty cool um, to see what the educators and the research staff at Adelaide Uni are doing so yeah yeah yeah. excellent 
All right. Well, I have one more quick question about you know, on this topic of the future. Um, I'd love to know what we can expect from Elk Lines moving forward, you know, maybe in the short term and maybe even, you know, some of those dreams that you've got tucked away, maybe back here somewhere, you know, <laughs> <Right the way laughs> if back. you'd like to share. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so this vintage, I'm really excited. I'm doing uh, little collaborations will be something that I do. I love doing things with people. I'm a very social person and I love, you know, bouncing my ideas off people. So um, a lady called Susie Whiting and I, she's worked at Samuels Gorge for many years and um, her and I are going to do a collaboration this year. We're, we're deciding on a name. We're both massive music lovers and she was a very cool drummer. She's just actually um, sold me her old drum kit and I've given it to my son for Christmas. So awesome. everyone thinks I'm mad, but um, I can't wait for Jax to become like the next Dave Grohl. I'm a bit of a Dave Grohl fan. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. um, so we've, um, I think we've decided on uh, Suava. Um, Suava means music in um, Sanskrit. So Svara, sorry, Svara. It's S V A R A. And in, in Sanskrit, it means music. So um, I think we've decided on that for our name. And then we're going to, yeah, do a little collaboration. It'll be under the Elkwines banner. Um, and we'll just, yeah, create something pretty special. And, and I'll continue to do that with friends and, and people I meet along the way. I think that's the way I want to go. Um, it's good to, yeah, as I said, bounce ideas off each other and have a bit of fun while you're doing that. If you can do that with people you that have common ideas. And we sat down already and discussed and we were just saying exactly the same thing at the same time. So we're on the same page and it'll nice. be a bit of fun. Yeah. Mm. And then going forward, um, obviously a cellar door is definitely high on my priority list. It's huge. It's something I think will be a five-year plan thing, um, but something you do when you know, you can. Um, and as I was saying to you before, a mutual friend of ours, Stu from New Mexico, he, him and I, we all lived in Japan together when we were we did. back in our 20s. And um, he just sent me this awesome elk horn from all the way from a ranch. He works at New Mexico. Thanks, <laughs> Stu, you legend. Um, and, um, yeah, it will certainly hold a dear spot on the wall somewhere in my new cellar door when I get there. There's a spot in Greenock. I've already talked to some locals who are in the spot I want to do it in and I'm just sort of weaving my way and when I get to that point I'll jump at it. But um, yeah, 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 yeah years away yet. Pictures. Love to see the pictures yeah. of that. <laughs> well it yeah. sounds exciting. All of it sounds exciting, Alka, I must say. <laughs> Um, we are drawing to a close today, but yeah, I've also got to add that it's been a fabulous conversation. You know, I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this and yeah, thanks so much for taking some time and joining the show. Thank you, boys. Great to see you after all these years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for those who are interested in learning more about Elka and Elk Wines, of course, you can find out by visiting her website, www.elkwines.com. And also, you can look her up on Instagram. Of course, too, if you like today's show, please be sure to tell a friend and share. Um, to show further support, you can rate, review, and subscribe wherever you access your, your podcasts. And also, too, we just launched a YouTube channel, Life As A, um, where you can see the full video conversations of these talks, just like today. Um, and of course, don't forget to join us on the next episode of Life As A, where we'll continue to explore and unearth the details of professions and the people behind them. I'm your host, Christopher Schoenwald. Until next time, stay curious about life and living.